It's hard to imagine that the groundbreaking sci-fi horror film Alien was released in 1979. Consider that, at the time, black and white TVs were not yet widespread, and watching a movie was a luxury. Yet, in such an environment, Alien emerged as a classic in the sci-fi genre. It not only reshaped people's understanding of sci-fi films but also, with an investment of $11 million, set a box office record of nearly $200 million. To this day, no other horror film has surpassed the iconic monster IP created by Alien. The story unfolds in a future world where human technology has advanced to the point of freely traversing the vast universe. The spaceship Nostromo, loaded with 2,000 tons of ore and a crew of seven, is on its way back to Earth. However, during the journey, the ship's AI system mother detects an unidentified signal. It prematurely awakens all crew members from their hypersleep, thinking they have arrived in the solar system. They start discussing the profit sharing for the mission, only to realize, upon reaching the control room, that they are not in the solar system but in an uncharted galaxy. The crew is bewildered, attempting to contact Earth's navigation center but receiving no response. The ship eventually arrives near a planet called LV-426. Captain Dallas learns in the control center that Mother altered the original trajectory because it intercepted a distress signal. Given the possibility that it's a distress signal, Mother autonomously changed the course. Now, their mission is to reach the planet emitting the signal and engage in a search and rescue operation. Parker expressed great dissatisfaction, stating that they are on a cargo ship, not a rescue vessel, and he has no obligation to participate in a rescue mission. However, the scientist Ash pointed out that according to the company's contract, if they receive a signal suspected to be from an intelligent life form during the journey, they are obligated to investigate. Failing to do so would mean a breach of contract, and they would not receive a single penny. Hearing this, Parker immediately complied and the rest had no choice but to follow suit. They promptly piloted the ship toward the signal, unaware that this rescue mission would bring them untold disaster. Upon reaching the orbit of LV-426, the crew switched to a smaller spacecraft to approach their destination. However, during the descent, an accident occurred due to powerful air currents, damaging three out of four landing struts. Engineers Parker and Brett immediately went to emergency repair the landing struts. Meanwhile, Dallas, with two other crew members, donned spacesuits and headed toward the signal source. In extremely harsh conditions, the trio struggled to walk two kilometers and finally reached their destination. Unexpectedly, the source of the signal was a crashed ancient alien spacecraft. Despite its eerie appearance and the potential for unknown dangers, they had no choice but to bravely explore. Following an oval-shaped entrance, the three successfully entered the interior of the spacecraft. However, due to poor communication signals, they lost contact with the control room's ash. They began to cautiously explore, climbing over a not-too-tall wall, and accidentally stumbled upon the cockpit of the ship, a scene that would be the most shocking in the entire film. In a cockpit resembling a cannon, sat a gigantic alien. Dead for who knows how long, he had almost melted with the seat, the entire body turned into a fossil. The wound on his chest seemed to be the cause of death, but strangely, the broken bones bent outward, as if something had burst out of his body. This discovery sent shivers down the spines of the three. Timid Lambert wanted to return immediately, but the executive officer Kane discovered a downward shaft. They decided to continue exploring downwards. Meanwhile, Ripley, who stayed on the ship, managed to decipher part of the signal through Mother. It didn't seem like a distress signal, instead, it resembled a warning. To be cautious, Ripley decided to call them back. However, Ash argued that it was too late, they were already inside the ship. Going there would be like walking into danger. Simultaneously, Kane had descended through the shaft into the bottom of the spacecraft. The temperature here suddenly became warmer, and the space was much larger. Under the blue laser light, there seemed to be many spherical objects. Kane accidentally slipped down and found some kind of unidentified organism's eggs everywhere, Encased in a layer of black slime, the substance strangely flowed upward. Upon closer inspection, it seemed like something inside the eggs was squirming. Oblivious to the imminent danger, Kane was still curiously observing. Suddenly, one of the eggs opened like petals, and an unknown creature inside lunged at him, attaching itself tightly to his helmet. When Dallas and Lambert brought Kane back to the ship, he was already in a coma. However, upon learning that an unidentified organism was attached to Kane, 
Ripley firmly refused to open the door. It could potentially contaminate the entire ship, posing a threat to everyone's lives. According to quarantine regulations, Kane had to stay outside for 24 hours before being allowed in. But in the urgency of the situation, Dallas thought rescuing Kane was a priority. Seeing the standoff, unexpectedly, Ash opened the airlock door, letting all three inside. Kane's helmet was severely corroded, and Ash carefully used a cutting tool to open it. They discovered the unknown organism was tightly attached to his face. Everyone gathered outside the medical bay, witnessing this incredible scene. Ash attempted to use forceps to separate the facehugger, but the more he tried, the tighter it clung. Its tail wrapped tightly around his neck. Kane was at risk of suffocation. Powerless, they decided to scan him first to see if there were any changes in his body. Surprisingly, they discovered that one of the facehugger's tentacles had extended into Kane's throat, providing him with oxygen. It seemed the facehugger didn't intend to kill Kane. Even though its motives were unclear, they had to proceed with the separation surgery promptly. Ash planned to cut at the joints, but as soon as the cutting tool breached the skin, a large amount of yellow blood spurted out, highly corrosive and burned a hole through the floor in an instant. Dallas sensed the danger and hurriedly went downstairs to check. He found that the floor had been burnt through, and worse, the corrosion was ongoing. It only weakened after burning through the second layer of the floor. The corrosiveness of the blood was unexpectedly powerful. Dealing with such a monster seemed nearly impossible, so they had to leave Kane in the medical bay and observe what would happen next. Meanwhile, Ripley confronted Ash, holding him accountable. If he hadn't opened the airlock door against regulations, this uncontrollable situation wouldn't have occurred. As a scientist, he shouldn't have made such a basic mistake. However, Ash appeared somewhat impatient, claiming that he did it to save a life, which was his duty. Shortly after, when they returned to the medical bay, they discovered that the facehugger on Kane's face was gone. As they searched, it suddenly dropped onto Ripley's shoulder from above, startling her. Strangely, the facehugger lay motionless on the ground, seemingly dead. After a thorough examination, Ash confirmed that it showed no signs of life. Though they didn't know the reason, Ripley insisted on disposing of it immediately to avoid any more accidents. However, Ash argued that this was an unprecedented extraterrestrial life form with high research value and should be taken back to Earth. Dallas supported Ash's decision, leaving Ripley puzzled about why the captain would endorse such a move. She continued to question him, expressing her distrust in Ash, who she believed had been acting unusually lately. Dallas clarified that as the ship's captain, he had no authority over scientific matters, those fell under Ash's purview. Additionally, it was a company policy. With the captain's endorsement, Ripley found herself powerless. Once the ship's landing struts were repaired, they departed from the planet and returned to the main ship. Uncertain about whether Kane was infected, the crew decided to cryogenically isolate him for further treatment upon returning to Earth. However, Ash urgently summoned everyone to the medical bay. To their surprise, the previously comatose Kane had awakened, seemingly perfectly fine. He was just exceptionally hungry. In celebration of the acting captain's miraculous recovery, Dallas arranged a hearty meal. Perhaps due to prolonged hunger, Kane's appetite was voracious. Everyone was joyous at this scene until Kane suddenly felt unwell. Ash, silently observing, appeared to have foreseen it all. In the next moment, Kane writhed in pain, collapsing onto the table, and started convulsing. The crew rushed to restrain him, fearing he might bite his own tongue. Unexpectedly, a horrific sight unfolded. With a pool of blood forming on Kane's chest, a creature resembling an eel emerged from his body. The tiny creature looked around innocently, displaying an adorable demeanor. Parker picked up a kitchen knife, ready to deal with it, but others stopped him because they had no idea how dangerous the creature was. Better not to act recklessly. After a brief roar, the little creature quickly vanished from their sight. To prepare for potential dangers, they tossed Kane's body into outer space and crafted weapons against the creature, a highly effective electric prod and a tracker. The tracker would immediately react if the creature appeared nearby. Under Dallas's arrangement, the six crew members split into two teams, scouring the ship for traces of the creature. Given the vast space of the ship, finding the tiny creature wasn't an easy task. However, Ripley's team quickly made a discovery. The tracker detected movement in the storage area. 
As they approached, the tracker's signals intensified, finally pinpointing the target to a nearby storage locker. The three members prepared cautiously, attempting to capture the creature. Yet, when they opened the locker, out came their pet cat. To prevent further disturbances from the cat, the crew split into two teams again. Ripley and Parker continued searching for the creature, while Brett went to catch the cat. However, as expected, things took an unexpected turn. Brett found the cat but encountered the creature simultaneously. Astonishingly, the creature had grown at an alarming rate, turning into a much larger form in just a few hours. Seeing the frightened cat, Brett sensed something was amiss but, unfortunately, turned around too late. <laughs> With another loss of a team member, panic set in among the remaining crew. Parker and Ripley clearly saw that the creature's size exceeded that of a full-grown adult, dragging Brett into the ventilation duct. However, Dallas saw this as an opportunity. The duct led to the main airlock, and there was only one access point, a maintenance hatch. By sealing the hatch and driving the creature into the main airlock, they could eject it into outer space. Considering that animals are generally afraid of fire, Dallas instructed Parker to craft flamethrowers. With everything set, they divided tasks. Ripley and Ash guarded the main airlock, Parker and Lambert sealed the maintenance hatch, and Captain Dallas took on the risky job of driving the creature. Dallas advanced segment by segment, with Ripley closing the rear airlock doors after each move. The tracker indicated the creature's presence, disappearing and reappearing, but they were certain it was nearby. As Dallas cautiously used the flamethrower to search for the creature, the tracker suddenly showed it rapidly approaching him. Everyone's hearts raced as Lambert urgently warned Dallas to leave the area, but it was too late. <coughs> now, even the captain was gone. Ripley insisted on continuing the plan unless a better option emerged. Lambert, however, was completely shattered. She didn't want to die and only wished to escape in the shuttle. Unfortunately, the shuttle could only accommodate four people. Parker, with a hot temper, was ready to confront the creature head-on. Luckily, Ripley remained composed. She intervened in time to stop Parker and emphasized that the only viable plan was still to drive the creature into outer space through the ventilation duct. Everyone brainstormed ways to combat the creature, but Ash remained silent, showing no signs of panic. Ripley sensed something amiss, so she discreetly went to the main control room while Ash was distracted. To her shock, she discovered the company's colossal secret. The change in course wasn't incidental, the real purpose of the ship's journey was to investigate the alien life form and bring back a sample. The company was willing to sacrifice all the crew members for this, and only the scientist Ash was aware of the plan. Even the captain was kept in the dark. At that moment, Ash suddenly appeared in the main control room. Ripley, now aware of the truth, was furious. She couldn't believe the company was so ruthlessly insane. Ripley rushed out to tell the others, but Ash wouldn't let her. He immediately closed the hatch to the corridor. Strangely, white fluids started dripping from Ash's head. Ripley returned, demanding he open the door. Instead, Ash violently yanked a handful of her hair. In an instant, Ash transformed, attacking Ripley expressionlessly and with unprecedented strength. He tossed her around, knocked her down, and forcibly stuffed a rolled-up magazine into her mouth. Just in the nick of time, Parker and Lambert arrived, but no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't separate Ash. Parker, in pain, grabbed a fire extinguisher and swung it at Ash, finally putting an end to his grotesque behavior. However, the next moment brought a horrifying revelation. Like a malfunctioning machine, Ash began convulsing uncontrollably, spewing out copious amounts of white fluid. Parker struck him again, and this time, Ash's head snapped off. It was only then they realized Ash was a synthetic human, a robot. In a desperate attempt to extract information on how to combat the alien, Ripley once again repairs the synthetic human. However, the answer she receives is grim. There is no method to kill the alien, it's flawless in both offense and defense, the epitome of organic perfection. After delivering this hopeless message, the synthetic human adds a taunt, claiming that the three of them have no chance of survival. Enraged, Ripley unplugs the power, declaring that the only option is to destroy the entire ship and escape in the shuttle. The trio springs into action, heading to initiate the ship's self-destruct sequence. Once activated, they have only 10 minutes to reach the shuttle. 
However, the shuttle needs coolant during its journey. Ripley heads to start the shuttle, while Parker and Lambert are tasked with fetching the coolant. Unexpectedly, as the two are installing the coolant, the alien appears in front of Lambert. Parker urgently shouts for her to move, intending to use the flamethrower against the alien. However, Lambert is paralyzed with fear, and Parker has no choice but to confront the alien head-on. In a brief struggle, Parker is swiftly overpowered by the alien, and in the blink of an eye, it dispatches him. Meanwhile, Lambert, still frozen in place, forgets how to escape. Her fate is sealed. Having just found the cat, Ripley hears the horrifying screams of Parker and Lambert. However, when she rushes to the scene, all she finds are their mutilated bodies. Terrified, she turns and runs, quickly reaching the control room. She initiates the ship's self-destruct sequence. After five minutes, the self-destruct cannot be halted, and in ten minutes, the ship will explode. With the cat in one hand and the flamethrower in the other, Ripley sprints toward the shuttle. However, as she approaches a corner near the shuttle, she nearly collides head-on with the alien. Fortunately, it doesn't detect her, but her only path is blocked. Time is running out. Ripley places the cat back at the original spot to divert the alien's attention and quietly returns to the control room to shut down the self-destruct system. Unfortunately, she is too late to disarm the self-destruct within the initial five minutes. Helpless, Ripley returns once more, prepared to face the alien in the final five minutes. However, upon reaching the same corner, she discovers that the alien is gone. The cat is unharmed. With only a minute left, Ripley hastily closes the safety door and launches the escape pod. At the moment of separation from the ship, Ripley finally breathes a sigh of relief. Not long after, the ship behind her exploded. She thought everything was over. However, just as she opened the airlock, preparing to lie down for a rest, the alien, perfectly concealed in the corner, suddenly extended its claws. It had already sneaked into the escape pod. Fortunately, it went unnoticed earlier, but this couldn't go on. Ripley had to find a way to put an end to it. Quickly donning a spacesuit, she emerged from the pod with a harpoon gun. Carefully sitting in the pilot's seat, she secured herself with the safety harness. After some maneuvers, Ripley forced the alien out of its hiding spot. Then, she opened the airlock, intending to suction the alien into outer space. <sighs> However, to her surprise, the harpoon got stuck in the airlock. Furthermore, the alien displayed incredible vitality even in the vacuum of space. It attempted to crawl into the engine. Seeing this, Ripley hurriedly ignited the engines, using the high temperatures to burn the harpoon free. Finally, she cast the alien into the dark expanse of space, bringing a definitive end to the ordeal. After documenting everything that had transpired, Ripley entered the hibernation pod. She didn't know how long she would drift in space or if anyone would come to rescue her. <laughs>